Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to make my contribution to the debate on the estimates of revenue and expenditure for the fiscal year 2024-2025. Specifically, Mr. Speaker, the motion by the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Development, the Youth Economy, Justice and National Security. Be it resolved that the Honorable House of Assembly do adopt the report of the Standing Finance Committee on the estimates of revenue and expenditure for the financial year 2024-2025 in the sum of one billion eight hundred and ninety four million one hundred and ten thousand eight hundred dollars as a charge against the consolidated fund and other funds of the state of St. Lucia. And Mr. Speaker, before I get down to business with the central issue before me, I want to, of course, in the course of this debate, respond to a few arguments emanating from the benches of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, I wish to clarify an issue on which there has been much subterfuge by the opposition and leader, by the opposition of course, and the leader in particular, yesterday while the member for Chozelle Saltibus was on his feet, again tried to peddle this propaganda, Mr. Speaker. This is the subject of debt and borrowing. These subjects raise great emotion, Mr. Speaker. And it is important that we clarify and distill these important concepts in economics and finance. First, Mr. Speaker, borrowing can take place for two reasons. The first one is to finance the deficit, which adds to the debt stock and increases the public debt. I repeat, Mr. Speaker, the first is to finance the budget deficit, which adds to the debt stock and increases the public debt. The second, Mr. Speaker, is to borrow to finance existing debt. This second category does not increase the public debt as it, in effect, results in a rolling over of our debt. In the case of the latter, Mr. Speaker, we have had to do this frequently, given that we have a large stock of short-term debt as there is no appetite on the part of regional investors to offer long-term debt. So, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the matter which we should be concerned about is the budget deficit, as this is what really increases our public debt. However, we heard the leader of the opposition speaking about borrowing and debt as if the two were the same thing. It is really part of the tools of trade. I guess he learned from Cambridge Analytica and the strategy to use shock and awe on the public. This misinformation which is being disseminated by this sophist, Mr. Speaker, must be exposed. The leader of the opposition then reads from an IMF press release which indicates that our long-term public debt on the current policies will stabilize at 75% of GDP and hence the need to consolidate, which in effect is another term for reducing expenditure or raising revenue or a combination of both. So when you hear about consolidation, is either re you reduce expenditure, you increase your revenue, or you do both of them, Mr. Speaker. He reads this, Mr. Speaker, with glee. And the sad thing about this, Mr. Speaker, is that he is fully responsible for this significant increase in debt. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition was responsible for incurring the largest single debt in the history of St. Lucia for the Hiwanora Airport project. In order to refresh his memory, Mr. Speaker, 
He borrowed US 100 million, or approximately 270 million ISI dollars from the government of the Republic of Taiwan. He further borrowed a sum of 202 million dollars from a consortium of banks, an amount of 45 million or approximately 122 million from the World Bank. The total amount he borrowed for the UNRWA project was close to $600 million, Mr. Speaker. Let that sink in, Mr. Speaker, a total amount of $600 million. While most of this borrowing is yet to be dispersed, yes, to, yet to be dispersed, and when it is fully dispersed, it will contribute to the single largest increase in our public debt, Mr. Speaker. Why is the opposition trying to mislead people into believing that this government is the one increasing the debt of the country? I just heard recently coming from this house on Monday that we have borrowed 600 million. But look, in one instant, I'm saying that 600 million dollars was borrowed, the single largest in the history of this country, Mr. Speaker. Our public debt stood at 4.4 billion at the end of 2022. Mr. Speaker, 600 million represents over 13% of our public debt. If we do the arithmetic, Slasper's debt accounts for over 13% of our public debt. If we did not borrow for this debt, Mr. Speaker, our public debt would be 13 percent lower mr speaker our approach was to engage in a ppp arrangement which we were doing in collaboration with the world bank we would not have found ourselves in that predicament mr speaker this approach mr speaker would not have increased the public debt this is an approach that is commonly used for efforts around the world mr speaker an approach that was used in Jamaica for the Sangster International Airport and now being used by the government of Barbados for the Gruntley Adams International Airport and of course for many other international airports in the world including Gatwick Airport, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Member for Miku South. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, the member is straying off of the uh, subject mm -hmm. matter today. Not that I, I don't mind. But I'm just saying, I thought that this was the kind of debate we would have had during the policy debate. But certainly, if the member is going to be given the latitude to do that, then it certainly changes my presentation. And remember, how don't, 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 don't give me a historical story. Just make your point. Point of order, members. The member is straying away from the, 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 the bill, the motion on the, on the floor, which is the estimate. Yes. Member for Lavery, the point of order is that you are not addressing the estimates. It is a point of order I concur with. You concur with that point of order. We are debating the estimates, Mr. Speaker, and it is relevant because in the course of this debate, the member for Schwazel emerged with it. And therefore, we no, cannot member, allow member, propaganda member, to masquerade member, in this chamber. As member part. for Library, we're not going to argue that. You are not, not debating the so estimates. So I am not supposed to respond. Please, I just want to have, have it clear. Please stick to the estimates before you. That's what I'm sticking to. That's what I'm sticking to, Mr. Speaker. But you see, I don't want to be recalcitrant, my Lord. And of course, I wouldn't beg for the leave. But I think the point has been made, Mr. Speaker, that members opposite borrowed over $1 billion during the time. And that's the point. They borrowed over one billion dollars which has member for which has implications for, library, for this exercise uh, member from Miku south mr speaker the member is again misleading the house he has the numbers in front of him there is nothing that shows that under the previous administration we borrowed over a billion dollars there's in the social and economic review there is no numbers that show that we borrowed over a billion dollars so member, the point of order you, the member is misleading the house mr. you need not respond to that just continue you want me to respond? Oh, because I have the numbers before me, and the numbers actually say so. It actually says so. So I beg leave, Mr. Speaker, just to 
with the numbers because it is a document of the House and the Economic and Social Review. Mr. Speaker, according to the figures, it's over $1 billion. $1.04 billion when you check total outstanding debt, and if we check total liabilities, it is $1.2 billion. A fact which is not subject to debate, nor compromise, Mr. Speaker. But I shall resume normal navigation, Mr. Speaker, at this juncture. Mr. Speaker, the estimates of revenue and expenditure provides the opportunity for parliamentarians to review the performance of the estimates of revenue and expenditure in the previous fiscal year, 2023-2024, and to examine the forecast made for revenue projections and expenditure allocations, both recurrent and capital for agencies for the new fiscal year 2024-2025. Mr. Speaker, ministers are concerned with receiving the resources to meet the department's public policies and priorities. Parliamentarians are concerned with ensuring that they obtain the resources to meet the needs of their constituencies and constituents. It is said, Mr. Speaker, that the whole is not simply the sum of its individual parts, and this is indeed the case with this budget. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, at the broader aggregate level, we are all concerned, especially members of this side of the House, with how the whole budget will impact the key macroeconomic indicators, namely economic growth and development, employment, investment, public finances, and debt. Mr. Speaker, the budget is, however, not only a tool of macroeconomic policy, it also allocates resources to the social sectors to facilitate the delivery of better educational outcomes, improve health care, and social equity. Resources are also provided for law and order, governance and democracy, and public administration. While I know we cannot get all of the resources we would want to implement our programs and projects, because we have a budget constraint and limited fiscal space, it is a budget that, while emphasizing infrastructure, provides resources to all agencies to achieve their policy priorities. Mr. Speaker, I have rated this budget a 10 out of 10 for its comprehensiveness in scope and approach and its breadth and depth. Not even the best political liar can refute the facts that lay bare in this honorable house. And my colleagues who spoke before me yesterday and of course this morning have actually articulated the facts in a way that one cannot refute. And in a moment, we will hear from the leader of the opposition and his arguments will be destroyed by self-combustion. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this budget builds on two previous budgets that the Minister of Finance delivered in fiscal years 2022-2023 and 2023-2024. And I go to the previous one. The first budget which was based on the theme empowering our people, transforming our economy, emphasized taking corrective measures to deal with many of the problems left by the former administration, a country that was deep in crisis. This is what we inherited from the member for Miku South. The second budget recognized the need to prioritize funding in health and national security given the neglect of these vitally important sectors by the last administration over the term in office. We are all aware, Mr. Speaker, that under the former administration, no monies were allocated for training for the police force, and the police were also starved of other important resources required to do their work effectively. In addition, Mr. Speaker, Many of the police stations which were built by our government were in a terrible state of neglect. The Minister of Finance took swift action, Mr. Speaker, by providing resources for training for the police and procured a fleet of vehicles for the police to carry out their work. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the Minister for Finance allocated resources to rehabilitate the police stations 
and to commence the new Northern Divisional Headquarters. As it, as it relates to healthcare, the former administration pussyfooted by doing nothing for more than two years and then abandon the project altogether and embark on squandering our money by building this huge box at the cost of over $118 million and left not one penny to complete this monstrosity, Mr. Speaker. And they feel they can come and parade in this house as if they can give people instructions. In fact, his legacy was to leave payables of millions of dollars which he owed to the contractors which the current Minister of Finance has to address. Mr. Speaker, a plan was put in place to complete the St. Jude's Hospital project and it is progressing nicely. And for those who are asking the question on a continuous basis, the hospital will be finished. But we have moved beyond that to provide better health care in this country as articulated by our competent Minister for Health. Mr. Speaker, we, we also had wiped out a huge debt, another legacy of, of the leader of the opposition and his government to the Cayman Health City Company for what he called managing the OKEU hospital. This budget, Mr. Speaker, is termed the year of infrastructure, acknowledging the need to address the major gaps in our economic and social infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, this series of budgets, when viewed from a sequential and integrated perspective, demonstrates the coherence and interconnectedness of these budgets. And that is how you manage a country. There must be a common thread which runs through all your estimates. And that common thread is managing the economy to create the right macroeconomic framework to deliver to the people of this country. This rally is a testament to the brilliance and mastery of the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance in not only the theory, but the practice of astute budgeting, economics, and finance, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance understands the finer points of economic analysis and policy and how to make the economy grow. His budget policies, Mr. Speaker, continue to grow the economy at a much higher rate than the long run, run average growth rate of 1.5%. And we are no longer lagging behind our OECS and CARICOM partners, Mr. Speaker. The economic growth rates delivered in 2021 and 2022 were 12.2% and 18.1% in 2021 and 2022 respectively. While the official growth rate for 2023 has not yet been announced, the latest economic forecast suggests that growth is around 3.2%. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance and Honorable Member for Cassius East does not simply talk the talk, but he walks the walk. It is rather shameful that the leader of the opposition would like to take credit even for the economic performance in our country. And he talk about his policies. His policies that plunged our economy into a recession in 2019. And every time I make the point, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the opposition plunged the economy into a recession in 2019, he stands up to object. I guess this time he will remain in his seat. But Mr. Speaker, he caused the economic growth rate to fall from 2.9% in 2018 to minus 0.3% in 2019. He then said a recession is identified by two or three years of, of, of negative growth. This is not true, Mr. Speaker. This is incorrect. It is two consecutive quarters, which I am fully aware, and you should be fully aware. So when you objected and you said it is a few years of declining, of, of declining growth, that is not correct. Everyone knows that I do my research, Mr. Speaker, and I do my analysis before I speak. I wish to now put this matter to rest once and for all to prove what I said was correct. Mr. Speaker, I invite the leader of the opposition to go to the statistics website, the official source of data for St. Lucia, and to go to the specific table published by our statistics department on quarterly GDP growth rates and constant prices. On that page, Mr. Speaker, we will see that quarter two growth rate 
for 2019 was negative 0.7 percent and quarter free growth rate was negative 2 percent mr speaker the economy was therefore indeed in a recession as we recorded two consecutive quarters of negative growth mr speaker i am indeed correct he plunged the economy into a recession and had we left him there mr speaker he would have plunged our country into a depression the leader of the opposition then has the audacity of trying to lecture members on this side of the house on how to grow the economy. Mr. Speaker, he had the opportunity while he was the Minister for Finance and his record speaks for itself. In fact, the people of St. Lucia gave him a failing grade on July 26, 2021. I cringe again, Mr. Speaker, when I heard the leader of the opposition trying to explain fiscal arithmetic of debt sustainability. He pointed out that there were only two variables that were important. He said debt and GDP. And that if debt was growing faster than GDP, we had a problem. Mr. Speaker, the literature on debt sustainability is well established. And any student of economics will tell you that you need to consider the primary balance, the stock of debt, and the interest rate in any analysis of examining debt sustainability. You should understand, Mr. Speaker, that you cannot hoodwink this side of the house by preaching voodoo economics, another term for chasnomics, Mr. Speaker. I now wish to examine, Mr. Speaker, the 2024-2025 estimates of revenue and expenditure and begin by reviewing the budget summary on page Roman numeral 3. Mrs. Mr. Speaker, this page provides the macroeconomic data underpinning the budget. I shall first begin by analyzing the performance of the budget in fiscal year 2023-2024. This, Mr. Speaker, is the report card of this government. The projected outturn for total recurrent revenue collections is 1.376 billion in fiscal year 2023-2024, representing an increase of 125 million, or approximately 10% over the actual revenue collection of 1.251 billion. This increase in revenue is due, Mr. Speaker, to an increase in tax revenue of 121 million, or 10.7% to 1.253 billion. Notwithstanding this excellent performance, we felt we fell short of our total budget projections for recurrent revenue, collecting 97.3% of the budgeted amount of $1.413 billion. In terms of grant receipts, we fell short, Mr. Speaker, as the lower than expected implementation rate in capital expenditure negatively impacted our grant receipts, resulting in us collecting only half the budgeted amount. We expect to rectify this issue in the new financial year, the year of infrastructure by accelerating the implementation of capital projects. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to expenditure and first examine current primary expenditure. This category of expenditure, Mr. Speaker, increased from 959.8 million in 2022-2023 to a projected amount of 990.7 million in 2023-2024. This increase of 30.9 million or 3.2% is lower than the budgeted amount of 1.035 billion. This, Mr. Speaker, shows the fiscal dexterity of the Minister for Finance in expenditure management, fine-tuning expenditure in keeping with the need to prudently manage our public finances. Current expenditure, which includes primary expenditure and interest payments, increased from 1.133 billion in financial year 2022-2023 to a projected amount of 1.206 billion, reflecting an increase of 6.4%. This amount was also lower than the budgeted amount of 1.254 billion. Total capital expenditure less principal repayments increased from 1.917.7 million in financial year 2022-2023 to 259.6 million in financial year 2023-2024, but was lower 
than the budgeted amount of 302.1 million, reflecting a lower than expected implementation rate. Mr. Speaker, it's important to note that 106 million of the 259.6 million was used to pay DFC obligations and therefore has limited the ability of our government to finance critical capital investments. A legacy. Mr. Speaker, I wish to now examine the critical macroeconomic indicators which are derived from the figures above. First, the trend improvement in the primary surplus continued with an increase from 62.2 million or 1% of GDP in the financial year 2022-2023 to 104.1 million or 1.5% of GDP. Similarly, Mr. Speaker, the overall balance remained relatively constant, dropping slightly by 0.1% of GDP to 1.6% of GDP. This is brilliant management and balancing, Mr. Speaker. Finally, the net financing requirement for the budget increased to 222.1 million, but was substantially below the budgeted amount of 288.7 million. By any measurable standard, Mr. Speaker, this is a commendable budgetary performance, and the Minister of Finance must be commended for his excellent stewardship of the public finances. Don't forget, we took this country in a crisis in a crisis where the economy had contracted by 25.4% and we did magic. In bad times, the member for Casuist East caused the economy to climb like a homesick angel. Just watch what's going to happen in the period ahead. I now turn to the budget for fiscal year 2024-2025. This budget, Mr. Speaker, reflects the thrust by government to address critical constraints to growth and development by implementing critical economic changes from the projected outlook in financial year 2023-2024 vis-a-vis the budgeted amounts in financial year 2024-2025. In the case of revenue, Mr. Speaker, the budgeted amount As a result, Mr. Speaker, total recurrent revenue is forecast to increase from $1.376 billion to a budgeted amount of $1.475 billion, an increase of $99 million, Mr. Speaker. Grants, Mr. Speaker, are projected to increase from $73 million to a budgeted amount of Mr. Speaker, in line with the need to keep expenditure increases in line with revenue, current primary expenditure and current expenditure are projected to increase from 990.7 million to a budgeted amount of 1.073 billion and from 1.20 with driving economic and social development, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in keeping with government's priority to emphasize infrastructure and to address current structural impediments to growth, capital expenditure less principal repayments is expected to increase by 15.3% from 259.6 million
critically important to narrow the infrastructure deficit, which imposes severe constraints on the future growth of the economy and delivers better infrastructure for the people of this country, thus improving lives and livelihoods. Mr. Speaker, the theme for this year's budget is infrastructure. It is well known, Mr. Speaker, that economic growth and development requires sound infrastructure. Moreover, sound infrastructure provides essential goods and services to the people. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, the budget provides significant resources for the improvement in infrastructure in our country. Mr. Speaker, given that there is a long list of infrastructure projects in the budget, I will only highlight some of the major infrastructure projects, starting with the roads, Mr. Speaker. You would have thought, Mr. Speaker, that all the roads were fixed by the former administration during the term in office, given that they were boastful about their record on road rehabilitation. If they had fixed up so many roads, we would not have so many complaints about bad roads in St. Lucia immediately after an election, Mr. Speaker. And it brings into question the spending of the $1.1, $1.2 billion by the former UWP administration. But Mr. Speaker, this could not be further from the truth. And we inherited a poor road network in which the majority of roads required immediate attention. And this again is a legacy that we have inherited. Our government has started its program of road rehabilitation this year. And in the upcoming financial year, the rehabilitation and maintenance of roads will be intensified, Mr. Speaker. The major ongoing project is the West Coast Road and the Millionaire Highway, underhead 43, subhead 41, line 0037, for which an allocation of 41.7 million has been made. Allocations of 10 million and 8.3 million have been made for the road improvement and maintenance project. And that is head 43, line 41, um, subhead 41, line 0506. And the rehabilitation of the Julian Hunt Highway, head 43, subhead 41, line 0504, Mr. Speaker reflecting government's efforts to improve the road network. <coughs> In addition, an allocation of $3 million has been made for the shock bridge, head 43, subhead 41, line 0507, which should have been reconstructed under the DVRP project, but for some strange reason, Mr. Speaker, the former administration reallocated funding from the shock bridge to build community centers and HRDCs. Mr. Speaker, I ask myself, why would a government do such a thing? To reconstruct a critical and strategic bridge which joins Cassidy's with Grosley, in which thousands of vehicles commute on a daily basis to use those funds to construct an extravagant HRDC in Hudson costing $10 million and another one in Blanchard de Rousseau. Maybe the leader of the opposition can shed light on this conundrum. I understand, Mr. Speaker, that the World Bank had serious reservations when the former administration made a request to, of course, reallocate funds for these centers from the shock bridge. I also understand, Mr. Speaker, that they wanted to reallocate funds that were earmarked for the PI bridge, but that request was rejected. Hence, the significant delay in implementing the PI bridge by the former administration and the fast tracking of the HRDCs. In the area of health, Mr. Speaker, our government has advanced the progress required in implementing the St. Jude's project. With four buildings currently under construction, which are expected to be completed by the end of the second quarter of the new fiscal year. Funding for the completion of the remaining buildings has been secured and we expect a contract to be awarded soon. An amount of $67.2 million has been allocated in this year's budget for the St. Jude's Hospital Reconstruction Project on the head 56, subhead 41, line 0078. An allocation of just over $2 million has been allocated for the construction or rehabilitation of the Sufre Hospital. 
on the head 56, subhead 41, line 0483. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, funds have been allocated for the Larishus Wellness Center, $800,000. Head 53, subhead 103, line 0479. Establishment of the Cassaries Urban Polyclinic. Also, another $800 million under the same head and subhead. And the rehabilitation of the Comfort Bay facility. In my constituency, Mr. Speaker, under head 53, subhead 116, line 0478. Funds have also been allocated, Mr. Speaker, for the construction of the Halls of Justice, head 56, subhead 41, line 0484. The construction of the police headquarters head 56 subhead 041 line 0482 and the rehabilitation of the Judge Odlum Stadium on the head 56 subhead 41 line 528. It is expected that the preparatory works will be undertaken for all these projects and that these projects will continue in the subsequent financial year. So preparatory works have already started, and of course, it shows planning, foresight, and from moving from one period to the next. In recognition of the need to improve the education infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, the government has allocated over $14 million for the rehabilitation of schools, head 52, subhead 42, line 0251. I also wish to note a significant allocation of 16.4 million to the Human Resource Capital Resilience Project, head 52, subhead 80, line 0328, and over 3 million in the Education Quality Improvement Project in the Ministry of Education, Mr. Speaker. That is how a government deals with the balanced development of a country. The infrastructure, police, and fire stations are also provided for in the budget, in particular, a sum of two million is included for rehabilitation of police stations. Head 37, subhead 43, line 0264. And we are aware that work is ongoing on the Northern Divisional Headquarters being funded under a bold arrangement. I also wish to highlight, Mr. Speaker, that a sum of 1.2 million is allocated for the, for the establishment of a substation for the fire service on the West Coast. And that's head 36, subhead 26, line 0499. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, the CDB finance project, namely enhancing the resilience of the St. Lucia Fire Service, head 36, subhead 26, line 0497, will also provide for inter alia enhancing the fire and emergency infrastructure to be more resilient to climate and environmental hazards and improving the work environment. Fishing facilities are also given significant priority in this year's budget, Mr. Speaker, with an amount of 5.5 million allocated to the Schwerzel fishing port on the head 41, subhead 27, line 449, and allocations made for repairs to fishing facilities, head 41, subhead 27, line 0378, and the rehabilitation of the Castries Fisheries Complex, head 41, subhead 27, line 0501. In the area of renewable energy, Mr. Speaker, an amount of close to 10 million has been allocated for the renewable energy sector development project head 43, 0670317. This project focuses primarily on exploring the feasibility of geothermal energy for St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. As we seek to further diversify our, economies, our economy, Mr. Speaker, there is a growing trend to focus on the blue economy. And this year, we expect to intensify the development by allocating just over $11 million for the World Bank funded project unleashing the blue economy project. Head 43, subhead 92, line 0396. In the area of tourism, Mr. Speaker, significant investments will be made in that sector 
through the OECS Tourism Competitiveness Project, for which an allocation of 18.6 million is made on the head 46, subhead 098, line 0043, and 3.3 million is allocated for community tourism under the same head, Mr. Speaker, but line 0045. As we seek to address the housing deficit, Mr. Speaker, in particular for the low-income households, sums of $3 million and $2.16 million are allocated for proud head 48, subhead 55, <laughs> line 52. And the National Housing Assistance Program, head 48, subhead 55, line 366, Mr. Speaker. To improve the social equity, Mr. Speaker, an allocation of 4.6 million is made for the Basic Needs Trust Fund. 10th program, Mr. Speaker. Head 51, subhead 59, line 352. 5.2 5 million for the Human Capital Resilience Project and just under 1 million for the rehabilitation of human resource centers. In keeping with the need to improve the infrastructure of the constituencies, Mr. Speaker, an amount of 22.7 million is allocated for CDP projects under Head 56, which benefit many small contractors in the constituencies, Mr. Speaker. Under our Minister of Youth Development and Sports, we have seen the revival of sports in St. Lucia. We just went to Parliament We just went to Parliament for approval of a guarantee of $80 million to the, St. to the St. Lucia National Lotteries for sports infrastructure island-wide, Mr. Speaker, to create the necessary infrastructural environment <coughs> and needs so that we can mass produce athletes, Mr. Speaker, just like we intend to mass produce Nobel Prize winners with the improvement that we are making with education, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we often talk about the fact that we need to move into the digital economy as the world is moving rapidly in that direction. This is indeed the area in which the greatest level of innovation is taking place in the world, Mr. Speaker. The latest development which is expected to have a profound impact on the entire world is artificial intelligence. We also need to move quickly in developing that digital economy so that we are not left behind. When we think of infrastructure, now we cannot simply think of roads, bridges, and buildings, Mr. Speaker. We also need to think of digital infrastructure. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, we need to develop that infrastructure to facilitate the development of a digital economy. So that infrastructure refers to the integrated platforms, applications, and IT systems that enable businesses and governments to manage data, automate processes, and de deliver digital products and services. Mr. Speaker, we are in an era we call the fourth industrial revolution. And we need to be prepared to benefit from the opportunities that it presents. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of investing in digital technologies to facilitate the transition to a digital economy. Mr. Speaker, in essence, this Minister for Finance and this government is setting the stage for the structural changes required to move St. Lucia into a new phase of its development, which is more in keeping with the socio-economic realities of our time. This is what you call a government of vision and a minister for finance, an experienced captain that will fly the, the vessel of state in zero visibility and will carry us safely to our destination. Significant allocations have been made in this year's estimates, Mr. Speaker, and I will highlight some of these critical investments in digital technologies. A sum of 14.8 million has been allocated to four projects in the Department of Public Service, namely ICT Evolution Project, Head 22, Subhead 58, Line 0284. Government Island Wide Network under the same, under Head 22, Subhead 58, 
line 0007, known as GNET. The Caribbean Digital Transformation Project had 22 under the same head, and of course, the line 0348, and the National Trade Logistics Platform under the same head, Mr. Speaker. In the Department of Finance, allocations have been made for a budget module upgrade of $6.7 million, upgrade of Inland Revenue Tax Administration System of $1.5 million. Member for Library, you have 15 minutes left. And the Financial Management System, approximately $900,000. The final allocation I wish to mention, Mr. Speaker, is the $500,000 allocated in the office of the Prime Minister for the establishment of an innovation hub under Head 21. Now, Mr. Speaker, I have left the best for last. I am extremely proud that work has started on the library market on Square. This project, which was approved by our government during our previous term in office, was stopped by this insensitive, wicked, and vindictive opposition when they were in government. But I am indeed grateful to the Prime Minister that in his very first budget, he placed it. And we developed the plans a bit late because we had to go get the plans reapproved, have a, a new bill, bill of quantities. And of course, by Christmas, hopefully, we should see the completion of that project. Mr. Speaker, I believe this thing has paved the way beautifully for me to address myself before I take leave to speak about my constituency. Mr. Speaker, I wish to thank the people of Labry Auger again for making me the instrument of their wishes. And I did not simply emerge from some unknown area. I was immersed in community development. And before I was in politics, they knew me. Just like in the good books, God said, before you were born, I knew you. And so I was prepared. I was prepared for my role in this honorable house to represent them. And they did not send me here to look for Ruru and to engage in needless battles. They sent me there to advance their interest. And undoubtedly, Mr. Speaker, this is one of my proudest moments standing in this house when it comes to advancing the interest of the people of the Labry Auger constituency. Because this Minister of Finance, under very trying circumstances, has eased the squeeze on the people of Labry. When he pays facility fees, my people benefit. When he brought back in times past the distress fund, they benefit. When he paid math and English, CXC, they benefit. When he removed the VAT on certain building items, my people benefit. And I can just go on and on for 40 days and 40 nights, Mr. Speaker, talking about things that we are benefiting from. But I want to start by one of the allocations mentioned, CDP. I recall in 2016, a number of persons had contracts to execute works under a wicked and evil opposition when in government stopped every single one of them. And I'm pleased to say, Mr. Speaker, that I have started to address that particular problem. I have addressed two roads at Debois so far, one opposite the Catholic Church, one along the Labry beachfront, Mr. Speaker. The road near Gabriel Maximin. And he was heartbroken, Mr. Speaker. Gabriel Maximin, he was heartbroken. Because that road was in a terrible condition. And before we had an opportunity to return to government to build that road, he migrated to the silent continents of eternity. But he died with the faith. He died believing that we were going to win the elections and his road would be done. Today, he is smiling in heaven.
like Mr. Nickel. Mr. Speaker, I have also made interventions at that same day, Bois, and near the Kuman Satoshi. I have also commenced the construction of sidewalks at Black Bay, which after budget will continue in the direction of Pom. That's right. Mr. Speaker, before the school children around Black Bay to get to the school, and with people driving on that road at top speed, always jumping on and off the road, and the edge of the road always uneven. And last year when I spoke in this honorable house, I said we are going to commence. Remember you have 10 minutes left. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I made the point here that we're going to commence the, the, the construction of sidewalks. And we have. We are almost finished with Lower Black Bay, Mr. Speaker. After, after the budget, we will complete, we will join the two pieces. And then we will go in the direction of POM and also address the CDP roads in POM that were stopped by this insensitive and wicked opposition when they were in, in government, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is my intention to complete all those roads that have been stopped and to engage in new infrastructural works with the support of my colleagues. And I want to thank the Minister for Infrastructure for his intervention. I am pleased to say, Mr. Speaker, that as we speak, Majomel Road is under construction. And I can guarantee you, this is a strong road. The aggregates from Wheel Rock and the only reason why in science books you'll hear diamond is the hardest known substance. They didn't discover the wheel rock stones as yet, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I intend after the budget at Bewaje, the road near Curtis Rene, near Bokowen, another individual who had time to migrate to the silent continents of eternity and did not see the road, Bokowen. I am pleased to announce that it shall be done, Mr. Speaker. The road near Chef, the Francis family at Bewanger, will be addressed. And I'm sure the quadras would be very happy to hear that the road that was stopped by Massonson Glory Sidaba will be under construction after the budget. Mr. Speaker, I am confident that the year of infrastructure will help the library Auger constituency to catch up with matters of infrastructural development. Right. And we will start with the Cartin, Maganier, Monveros, and Auger. We shall start the road rehabilitation with the Cartin, Maganier, Wavinpon Road, Mr. Speaker. And obviously, Mr. Speaker, when St. Jude's, when the St. Jude's Hospital shall be reopened, the heavy vehicles, emergency equipment, will be going on the Pom Road, the Pom Oje Road, and therefore, in the public's interest, it shall be constructed. And it must not be recorded on the one of the roads for my constituency. <laughs> It, it's a national thing. It's a national thing. So when you are calculating how much money you are going to spend on roads for me, I want you to deduct that amount because it is our thing. It's a national thing. When you go into Kate, when you go into Debois, when you go into to the, the, the Wavin Pont area, then you, we, have, we have no debate. When we are going into Béwanger, Mr. Speaker, I am elated. I have not even seen the roads. I have not, not even seen them. But I'm excited. According to the late Bokoen, Ipoko Memdusi Ijadu. Just the announcement. Because there is an opportunity for hope under a St. Lucia Labour Party administration. Currently, the Ministry of Equity is organizing the plans for the erection of the OJ Multipurpose Center, as well as the Bans Youth and Vending Facility. Designs are being finalized, 
most likely will be implemented in, in the following year, Mr. Speaker. Let me state categorically that the upgrade of our recreational facilities cannot wait one minute longer. And between now and next year, I've got spare. All my major playing fields will be upgraded, including lighting. <laughs> and no, delivery, no, you five delivery. Minutes, yeah. You have five minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the school, at the schools in my constituency, I have had some bilaterals with the Minister for Education, and he has guaranteed me that my schools shall receive some level of attention. I know I have spent at the OJ Combined School in the vicinity of $1 million to help. And I know that the Ministry of Education will match that during this fiscal year. And I will account for every penny that they would spend, Mr. Speaker, in the next year's estimates to make sure that they match that amount that I have spent. I am hopeful that the Bans Laguas Combined School will receive the careful attention that it deserves by changing the pool bois classes to smart classrooms. You know, last year I told you, when you go to the Bans Laguas Combined School, you have to greet termites first before you see anybody. Termites are always in those buildings as if they are the ones teaching the classes. We must put an end to those termites, Mr. Speaker. The Labry Boys School deserves some level of attention, and Labry Girls, some, some surgery at Labry Girls. Mr. Speaker, as I prepare to close, in my four minutes remaining, <laughs> we are continuing along the lines of building and expanding our community tourism model to ensure that my constituents extract economic benefits from the model that we have been developing from decades ago. It is a quiet revolution that is taking place in the People's Republic of Labour. And any support by, by, by government will be welcome. And I see under the tourism allocation, there are opportunities for my people to tap into. We are currently working on the landing to one of our main waterfalls at Majomel. As we speak, they are working on the steps going to the Majomel um, waterfall. Next budget year, we are going to address ourselves to the Mont Leblanc lookout point. It will receive much support. Together with Ecolab, we will be developing it. Now, Mr. Speaker, there are other projects which should materialize during the course of this budget year, but I shall update you if it becomes necessary. The proud lands, Mr. Speaker, at Pom, Black Bay, and Oje. I am pleased to say to my constituents in that part of the constituency that very soon we will be completing those surveys and they will have access to purchasing those lands. And I want to repeat, at no time I will represent you and we will get a deal on lands that are any way above what it was in PI, what it was in Larry Shoes, and what it, is, what it was in Dermon. You see the same way that Dermon and Larry Shoes and PI people enjoy the benefits? We must enjoy those benefits because we were there before. And my people have suffered for decades. For decades. Some people have died. They made application to purchase those lands. They have died. The kids left again, and the grandchildren and great-grandchildren are there. I want to ensure that they receive the justice of the cause by getting title to those lands. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to say that the Library Fishermen's Co-op got a generous contribution from the Ministry of Physical Development. In terms of dealing with the library beachfront, we want to be in control of our beachfront. And we made a request to physical development, and now it is in the hand of the, the fisheries corporate. At Rudy John Beach Park, I signaled a long time ago that we're going to make application for us to upgrade our Rudy John Beach Park and the Labatui area 
will become the Rodney B of St. Lucia. It will, it will be like the Rodney Bay in my constituency. It is a place that many people consider to be depressed. And during, you know, the times of politics, they used to tell Labatwi people, pas venir un village là, mitan village là. The roads were bad. When I fixed the roads, they said they're going to build a big gate to prevent the rest of Labri from coming to Labatwi. Uh -huh. Member, could you wrap up now? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, thank you for granting me leave to make my brief intervention. But I will say to you, Mr. Speaker, in closing, that the Honorable Member for Labry will always rise to the highest traditions of parliamentary decorum in this house. And this is why I was very obedient to the ruling of the Speaker when he told me to deviate off an acceptable track. <laughs> I did not want to be recalcitrant, Mr. Speaker. And so I was obedient. But I thank you for your generosity, Mr. Speaker. I thank honorable members for their support. I want to thank the parliament staff for the invaluable support when I have to print my documents or when I want you know, my research done. I go and I ask for certain documents, always very cooperative. And I want to thank them, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to hearing an appropriate response from the leader of the opposition in terms of the figures that he was disputing, and I have the social and economic review. And if I believe it's necessary, I shall also rise on a point of order, Mr. Speaker. And I want to remind the member, I also have the right to respond to anything that he says when he speaks. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.